Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another edition of the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. Many, many years ago, in December 1997, I had an extraordinary dream. And it was a very, very vivid dream. I, know, I dream regularly, but normally I don't dream vividly. And ordinarily, I don't necessarily remember my dreams. But this one I particularly did. And I was off the coast somewhere, looking inland from the coast. And there were a bunch of, of houses and caravans on a beachfront. And then from nowhere, this huge whirlwind ripped up. And I saw sort of houses being ripped apart and uh, caravans being turned over and everything else. It was quite an extraordinary scene. And when I woke up the next morning, it played on my mind for, for quite a long time. And I thought that was just so very, very vivid. So then round about, that was in December, 1997. Now, in, in May of the following year of 1998, uh, my mother was visiting us and we took her down. We were living in Horsham at the time in West Sussex. And we went down to Selsey Bill for the day. And we walked along the coastline and we walked out. There's a kind of a jetty that runs out from Selsey Bill out into the, the, um, the English Channel. And we're on the jetty and I'm looking on towards the coast. And I realized the scene I was looking at was exactly the scene in my dream. And I thought that was quite strange because it literally was the place I saw. So when I got back home, I did a search on Selsey Bill and to my utter astonishment, I discovered that on January the 8th, 1998, that is a month after I'd had my dream and three months before I was looking at the scene, there'd been a tornado in that very location in Selsey Bill. So effectively what I'd done is I'd I had a precognizant, I precognized a dream, and the dream had, had, had been precognitive and of, of an event I was going to be seeing in my own future, blissfully unaware of the fact of the disaster that had taken place in that location. Now, to me, that was quite, quite extraordinary. And indeed, that was one of the things that stimulated me to, to be interested in writing my first book, because I became interested in exactly what precognition is. And what it really means. And can we come up with a, a rational scientific explanation for what precognition is? Now, you guys who know my work know that I believe I have got a, a logical and scientifically based alternative explanation for what precognition is that falls within what we understand as modern science. But one of the, our guests today, Daniel J. Taylor, is somebody who's been researching this for many, many years. Um, and indeed, I was delighted to discover um, earlier on today that uh, Daniel is in, uh, Dan is actually based in um, my effective home city of Liverpool and has lived there for a few years, which is delightful to hear. And also, we were just discussing off camera that Daniel has managed to do the impossible, which is living in Liverpool and managed to get sunburned uh, in, in April, in uh, May in Liverpool, which is a fairly clever thing to do, really. Um, but we'll discuss that in due course. Right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Daniel um, so that we can set the scene. As usual, I'm reading this because I'm not very good at reading, just like I am. I'm not very good at chewing and walking at the same time either. So... Without further ado, so Daniel, Daniel J. Taylor is a British dreamer, writer and researcher with an interest in extraordinary dreaming. He previously taught foreign policy and American studies at Canterbury Christ Church University and City University of London and went to study the paranormal at the famed Arthur Finlay College, a place I know well. After seeing the London Bridge terror attacks and Manchester Arena bombing in a prophetic dream three weeks before they occurred in 2017, Daniel developed an avid interest in, the extraordin in extraordinary dreaming. He eventually realized that many of his dreams related to the external world where he saw people in places that he had never seen before until he later came across them in the waking world. He began to experience the consciousness of victims of crime and realized that his dreams were trying to show him related relocations throughout through literal and symbolic imagery. Daniel is currently the editor of www.dreamprophecies.com and runs the Dream Circle Liverpool and the International Premonitions Bureau. He regularly contributes to the Echo World magazine, The Wire, Dreamtime magazine and pathos.com and is set to release um, his debut fictional book, Somewhere Beyond Jupiter. Right, just so you're wondering why I was slightly um, um, not concentrating there. I was saying to Sarah earlier on that I was expecting two deliveries today and both deliveries could have happened at any time from seven o'clock this morning to, um, to eight o'clock tonight. 
The first delivery arrived two minutes before we were about to go on air. And the second delivery has just arrived now. So there you go. That's how fate works and how the archons work. So without further ado, Jan, Dan, welcome to the rather chaotic Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. Right. Wonderful. I'm, I'm really intrigued as to um, your, your experiences with um, the London Bridge terror attack and, and yeah. the Manchester bombing. Can you tell us a little bit about this first to start us off and then we'll get into the more detailed psychic detective material? Sure. So the Manchester and terror attack dreams occurred one week and three weeks before they actually happened in the waking world. And at the time, I, I wasn't really sure what I believed in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, seeing things in dreams and them coming true and so on. But I had an inkling that that could be a possibility. But at the time I was writing down in a dream journal because I had quite a few unusual dreams. So I'd seen um, like a nuclear attack, which I interpreted to possibly be symbolic um, and a few other various kind of strange things. So I thought, well, that's quite interesting. I wonder what that means. So I ended up just sort of writing them down. And funny enough, I, when the actual events happened in the waking world, the, the terror attacks in London and Manchester, I didn't actually clock in my mind that that dream that I had previously was something that related to this. It was only my ex-partner who said, Dan, your dream just came true. And I said, hang on a sec, what are you talking about? She said, do you remember that dream that I told you, that you told me about? So I would dream. And I looked at a lot of the details that are in the dream and many of them actually matched the attacks. Um, so, for example, in the dream, there were three men potentially with machetes. And in the London attack, there were men attacking on a bridge with machetes. And I dreamt of a bridge in London. I also dreamt of a van or a truck. And that was quite interesting. I'll get into that, why that was more interesting a bit later on. But the dream was absolutely terrifying. And it, it starts quite unusually compared to most dreams that I've had. So it's, I saw television unravel, and it was one of the few dreams that I've woken up from and been absolutely sort of terrified from. And I was wetting and kind of, you know, quite scared. Um, but the thing is, the interesting thing about the dream was it said that attacks occur across several cities, possibly including Manchester. So it was very specific with the city. However, on the other hand, there were no other details to the Manchester attack. It just said possibly including Manchester. But the actual um, elements that did match, you know, there were lots of them. So I kind of am quite critical of my dreams. You can see that obviously many people have scary dreams. We have nightmares of fears that we could, you know, potentially be afraid of in the real world. Many people dream of terror attacks being attacked in general, earthquakes, volcanoes. But the thing is about this dream that was quite interesting was the many kind of elements that matched up. And it was only later on that I discovered that the day before those dreams, I'd actually had a dream of three Middle Eastern men, possibly Latin American. And we were on a plane and we were fighting and they had a problem with me for some reason. And when I look back and after all this kind of research into dreams, I kind of and understood that that was potentially a sequential dream because um, it turned out that for the um, at least for the London attacks there were three men that were involved in them um, so yeah the, this is what kind of got me interested in writing down my dreams every day mm. and trying to understand what they mean what they're trying to to life in general you know is, is something watching me watching everyone, everywhere we go in life, um, you know, how, how would I know that, you know, these things were going, going to happen? Uh, you know, I know a lot of people have prophetic dreams. It's not something special to me in particular. Um, it just happened that this dream was, you know, of an instant that is quite an emotionally disturbing thing to have happened. Um, fortunately for myself, I don't have a lot of dreams about terrorism in general. Uh, even though I mentioned some of these topics, for example, psychic detectives, you know, people being killed in dreams, I do talk about them, but I don't have them every night. Usually my dreams are quite tame. 
But going back to the uh, 2017 London and Manchester terror attacks, at the time I was doing a lot emotionally. I was lecturing at university. I was doing a PhD. I was working full time in a shop in Chester, running two websites. And it was probably way too much for, for anyone to handle at the time. So I was going through kind of a bit of an unhappy period where I was commuting to work, you know, looking out the window and, you know, just wishing you weren't on that commute, you know. Um, but it was during that time that some really strange things started to happen to me. So one of the most unusual, bizarre things that happened to me was that I started to see the numbers 1111 all over the place. So it, it was only for about a month that it happened. And I mean, it still happens today, but th this one month was just really strange. So it culminated in a train stopping halfway through a tunnel on a regular commute never stops in this tunnel. Looking out the window and just by my side seeing sign 1111, just by me. And it was, you know, no one else could see it. And that was what got me to finally Google it and say, what the, what the heck is going on? So I Googled it and I found out lots of things that people see these numbers and people call them angel numbers. I'm not sure if that's a fair term, but maybe it is. Um, and then this is when all of these things started happening. So it was really from 2017 and before that, I'd never really had many of these kind of um, things happen to me at all. I had some strange things, paranormal things happen to me, um, not many. I've always had an interest in paranormal. I love the X-Files television show as well. Um, but in terms of dreaming, I, I, I can't say that I had many unusual, unusual kind of dreams before that. Um, so yeah, that was the, the London Manchester terror attacks was the thing that really got me looking into my dreams much more, you know, extensively. And, and also, also, obviously I get into the psychic detective stuff because for me, that was just mind blowing for myself personally. Um, it's for me, it's to do with not just your dreams, but how you live in the waking world. And if you live in a way that is kind of like a lucid dream, you let life guide you in some circumstances, not all of them. Um, you know, you can end up finding very unusual things related to your dreams. Um, but there's obviously the problem if you try and live too lucidly, you know, you'll end up walking off the edge of the cliff because of the smell of the sea. You know, so you have to, you can't kind of go into life living too lucidly. But if you, if you can use it, you know, in a nice, um, in a way where you can kind of just use it in a very short period of time, sometimes things come to you um, just at the right moment. Um, so yeah, I, so, so those two things were the main sort of events that happened. Um, but after that, I started to dream of psychic detectives. I started to dream of being murdered. Um, very um, scary dreams. Um, at the time, I kind of thought it was me in the dream. Um, I had a dream where I was being stabbed by somebody in the stomach. Um, it's very scary. I was in a small room with somebody and I woke up and that was another kind of terrifying dream. And I started to have other dreams with the same person that was in that particular dream. So I had another dream where that person was pulling away two skeletons in water in Chester and Liverpool. Um, I was by a bridge dream, I had the, seen one of the skeletons and I pointed it out to her and said, did you see that skeleton in water? And she said, oh, there's not just one, there's two. And one of them hasn't got a head. Um, and that was when I saw this person who I know take them away on the boat. And the bridge had a kind of tables and chairs and a serving window by it in the dream. And basically, I this is after I had the London dream, I think. And I told my partner about it and said I might go to this place because I googled Lumley in Chester to see if there are any streets, Lumley Road, Lumley Avenue. And funny enough, there was one um, near Beish. So there happened just to be as well a stream by that street. So a leap of faith, I went there and my partner at the time encouraged me to go. I went to the stream, I walked along it and didn't find anything. So I felt like an absolute moron <laughs> getting off 
um, a little bit early from my usual stop, which is in Chester. And I just went back to my everyday life and I had a second dream. And in the second dream, I was in um, a wood, I had a group of people with me. I ran across a stream and in the stream written in sticks, in twigs, was the words, go left. And at the time it really scared me because when I actually went to this place in, in the first place in Beish, I couldn't go left because there was a tunnel and the only way to go left was to go into the water and actually walk through this quite scary looking dark tunnel um, to get to the other side. So basically in the dream I messed up the message and because it scared me inside the dream because it made me think well someone must be what I don't know, um, I ran on and I didn't tell the people until eventually I felt guilty and I said okay we've got to go left. But then in the waking world, I woke up and eventually realized that that dream related to my visit to this stream. So I ended up especially buying Wellington boots and there were coins that had been freshly minted. So one pound coins that had just come out. So it made me think, well, maybe someone had jumped in the water and they were in a rush. But I kind of thought, well, it could be nothing, okay? So ended up walking through the tunnel. I got to the very end of this area where you cannot get there apart from going through the tunnel. There's very steep banks. There's a kind of highway along the side, lots of thick, dense bushes and so on. So the only way that you can get to that area of the stream is to actually walk through the tunnel. So I got to the very end of the stream that was gated off and I couldn't go any further because it kind of went into kind of an underground sewer. And when, once I got there, there were these ducks that just kind of flew over my head and I just thought, okay, I've gone and done it again. I've, I've gone to a place because of my dreams and there's absolutely nothing here. And, you know, what have I done wasting my time again? I'm not going to tell anyone about this. <laughs> really embarrassing. Um, and then, so I kind of carried on walking back to where the tunnel was. And I kind of felt very kind of in tune with the world around me at that point. I felt very kind of meditative. And I was walking thinking, well, maybe... I might find something, who knows? And as I was walking back towards this tunnel, something fell from a tree, maybe a small leaf or a, maybe even a feather, or I'm not sure what it was, but it fell to the ground. And when I looked in the stream, there were ID cards there. I picked up the ID card and it had an address on. And the address on the ID card was the very same address of the person that I had dreamt of in the first dream. Uh, and the second dream. So the same house number in a city. I, bearing in mind, yes, it might be a small city, just not exactly a very large place, but um, you know, there's tens of thousands of people there. And I found this one ID card with the same address. So I thought that was very unusual. And I thought maybe my dreams were real. Maybe that wasn't me that was being stabbed in the dream. Maybe it was somebody else because. When I first had that dream with that person, I was worried that they might attack me. Mm. Um, but in the end, nothing happened. Um, so after that, I had another dream. And in the dream, I'm in a car. With, I think two other people. And we're driving around panic, and we have a body in the boot. We're trying to get rid of it. And we drift to a... It's kind of like a, it looked like a kind of canal or a river, and there was a bridge over it, a particular looking bridge that you can kind of walk down from a road. On. And in the sky, there were these kind of beams of light with squiggles in the middle. And um, it was like a purple sky, if I remember rightly. I can't quite remember that detail properly, but um, we were basically driving into the water with the car and got out of the water and there was a homeless person that saw it happen. And after that, when I woke up, I started to Google bridges and look at the street view images of bridges in Chester. And I discovered a bridge that looked exactly the same as the bridge in my dream. So eventually I decided to actually go to this bridge. And when I went to that bridge for the first time, it took a, a long time to walk there. 
Um, so it's a long walk along the canal. When I got to the bridge, there were these strange cloud formations in the sky. So it was a very clear blue sky. And then you had these four squiggles and lines. So it's like a, like a, can you imagine like a cloud coming down like this with a kind of squiggle in the middle like that? There were four of them like beams, just as I'd drawn them in my dream journal. So fortunately, my camera somehow managed to capture it when I took a picture of it. And it just, I got to the bridge that I saw it. So for me, that was really weird, really unusual. But I, all this time, I'm still thinking to myself, this can't be true. There's got to be something, I'm sure I'm just going nuts here, you know, what, what, what is happening? Um, to cut a long story short, eventually, forests have seen, allegedly, body parts in the water by that very bridge where I saw the beams in the sky that I dreamt of. And they'd called the police. And basically, um, the police had come to this bridge and they had done an underwater knife uh, to try and find any kind of remains. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't find anything. But for me, I thought to myself, right, this, is, this might be my dream. I have to go there and, and men mention it to police. So this was one of my first interactions with the police. And I went there and I told them about the ID card that I'd given in to them um, long, long ago. Um, and I ended up being interviewed by police about, you know, my dreams, what I've seen at the um, bridge. Um, and, and, and for me, that was a sign that I thought maybe if there was something I might be involved or there's something more to this. So I, I kind of put my neck on the line and decided to go into the police station and give this interview. And, you know, I told them that I think there might be something there that they might have missed. But since that time, you know, no one has done any searches or anything like that. But for me, there were so many different dreams that I had afterwards where I'd gone to a place and something very specific that was in the dream waking world that I thought was more than just chance. So other dreams that I had included um, a place in Soho, Hopkins Street. And in the dream, there was a building, two um, lifts. One of them was broke, the other one wasn't. And funny, a strange little detail as well in that dream was that there was um, feces in the building, in the lift. So I found the street because I dreamt of Katie Hopkins, who I'm sure a lot of people don't like, <laughs> just people that love her as well, but um, I dreamt of her and um, I found this place called Hopkins Street in Soho because the dream was in London, there were prostitutes in the dream. So I went to um, this street, Hopkins Street, and um, I found this building, a very tall building, and there's lots of tall buildings in London, we give you that, but when I went up to the building, there were two lifts. There were no other high buildings on this street, but there were two lifts. One of them was broken. The other one was working. I managed to just have a look around. And when I walked into the building, I walked up the stairs and in the stairway, there was a big lump of feces. You know, I mean, that, that's for me, it was, just one little thing there were multiple things that kind of matched up and it was this particular building and I wouldn't have gone to any other building on that, that street or in the general area uh, there were other dreams where I dreamt of um, a stream and someone's feet sort of buried in the stream covered in water and with this dream in particular this is a dream about where I'm from in Pets Wood it was a very specific place that you could pinpoint by several meters. So I decided to visit this place in Petswood and I walked along the entire stream. I didn't find anything apart from in that one spot in the stream. And what I found in that spot where I dreamt of the shoes was a burnt shoe. I mean, this could be chance, um, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of shoes walking around the street that you can find discarded. And this in particular was a burnt shoe and it just happened to be in the precise spot that I dreamt of. Um, not only that, 
you know, along the entire length of the stream that I walked along, there was nothing else there um, at all in terms of shoes or other items of clothing. Um, so that those are kind of like the main uh, dreams that I had, apart from another one involved um, with Manchester. Um, I had a dream of Manchester, a bowling alley underneath a, a train track, uh, and the train track arch was rounded. And I discovered that this place, this bowling alley actually existed, and this was to do with a missing woman that, in a river. Um, but the details, again, for that one, I don't feel like they were enough for me to actually find anyone, but there were enough kind of matching details for me to say, I've definitely seen this place in my dream. Uh, I didn't know it existed. I've never been there before. A railway track over a bowling alley with a sort of curved arch is, is something quite, I think, quite unique in a way. It's not something that you see every day. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's often been kind of incidences where there are many kind of unusual dream aspects that match up that make me think, okay, well, there's something there that maybe couldn't just be chance. Um, so you know about the dream that I had about the Russian invasion about a year before the Ukrainian invasion. I dreamt of Russian tanks in the snow, Putin's tanks waiting to invade the country. I mean, for me, it could be prophetic, but for me personally, I didn't really feel that there were uh, kind of enough details there for me to be entirely convinced that it, you know, I, I, when I do get these details come through in my dreams, I'm very critical to ascertain whether the dream is prophetic or something that's even worth looking into. Because if it's a, a vague dream, you know, you're just going to be walking around, you know, films finding nothing and it's only when I have enough details in a dream that I think okay, this place might be worth visiting. Mm. And this is um, very, so yeah, that, that was my experience. With that. This is very intriguing, isn't it? I mean, there were so many factors I could pull out from the things you were just describing there. I mean, the first one that leapt out at me was your description yeah. of the 11-11 phenomenon. And I'm always interested in synchronicities and synchronicity intrigues me. Now, I've, I've always argued that the 11-11 phenomenon, and there's a lot of people I, I work with who are interested in the 11-11 phenomenon, and putting my, my skeptics cap on, you know, I could turn around and say, well, it could yeah. easily be to do with the way in which they are vertical things sticking up from the horizon so that we are programmed always to notice yeah things sticking up from the horizon and also you know any sequences of numbers we notice however however and it is a massive however Definitely. is that i know that 1111 is significant for me for another reason and that reason is that the dutch edition of my first book was published in dutch and they changed the title of the book title and they changed the title to life after life after life in dutch which is 111111 and that was to me the most extraordinary realization that it's nothing to do with the sequence of numbers. It's to do with how we seem to co-create our world around us. And you know, when people turn around yeah. and say, you know, it's, it's confirmation bias or it's, it's um, attention bias. But the question then has to be asked, yeah. well, this is suggestive of the fact that our attention is, is heightened because of these things and we notice the things more like you were saying you know the way you see things in greater detail and you're looking for these things but just because you're looking for them doesn't invalidate the fact of the stimulus that made you look for them in the first place isn't it exactly yeah yeah definitely yeah. I, I just think it's really interesting how you know i did see that thing in the sky when i got there but you know was that because i saw the future you know, that I was going to go there. And then I, you know, that kind of passed that back to myself, you know, mm -hmm. J.W. Dunn style, you know, serialism style. Um, but the thing is, I would never have got to that bridge if it wasn't for the dream in the first place. Yeah. So, I, you know, for me, it's really interesting to try and kind of ascertain, like, how do I end up in these places? And would, have, would I have always have had that dream? It's like with a dream where you dream of a disaster and you avoid the disaster and save your life. People say that dream saved your life, 
but you know you might have always been destined to have that dream and you were never actually going to die because you were always going to have that dream yes you know so th these are the really interesting questions that come was, up i'm reminded here of um i think it's frederick myers um who described a fans fascinating incident that took place in um, around about the 1880s um, in North London uh, by the Regent's Canal, maybe canals, maybe it's w water, I don't know. And this lady had had a reoccurring dream. Oh no, she hadn't. She'd had that dream that particular night and it particularly terrified her because she was walking along the canal and she was being chased by a monkey and the monkey was, was, was being aggressive with her. And when she woke up the next morning, she was quite distraught and her husband turned around and said, well, you know, don't be silly, you know, so maybe today take yourself off for a walk down the canal because she had no intention of walking down that canal that day. But go down the canal, walk down the canal and, and put your mind at rest. So against her better judgment, she goes out and she's starting walking down the canal. And as she's walking down the canal, the monkey appears and it's jumping from tree to tree and it's bothering her. And it, it had escaped. Some local lady had a menagerie and the monkey had escaped. But the fascinating thing here is that if she had not had the dream, she would not have gone for the walk along the canal that day yeah. and would yeah. not have seen the monkey. Exactly. So, again, you know, it's kind of reciprocating on itself, isn't it? It's like a Russian dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's really bizarre as well, like um, when you have a shared dream with somebody else and you see things that they see in their future, so I've had a few instances in my life where I've seen and experienced somebody else's consciousness and realized that it wasn't me, but it was somebody else. And I dreamt of a person in the same dream, kind of like a separate segment. And that kind of made me tell that person, oh, I had this dream where I'm walking around a, a you know, high rise flat with big windows and I'm worried that people can see me naked, but I don't care, I carry on walking around. And then they tell me, are you kidding me? I was literally in, you know, an apartment last night, walking around, worried that people could see me naked. And I mean, it's kind of a bit scary in a way. I mean, it's I've never been able to actively try to experience that. It just happens. And yet and yes, I don't know what it means. Jumping in here necessarily. Just very quickly, just jumping in there, because that is very intriguing, isn't it? So effectively, yeah. you had the dream, which then you brought up with the person who then told you yeah. because you'd mentioned the dream that they'd been wandering around naked the night before. But again, if you'd not mentioned the fact and you'd not had the dream, you wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have given you that information in the first place. Um, exactly. And the interesting thing about that dream was that there was a, sec a separate segment. So there was a dream, I think it was just before or just after on the same night. And I saw my friend and that person I knew had some bad news that they hadn't told me. And then I saw like advertising, something to do with advertising, a businessman. And she said to me, Dan, that is amazing. I I've got some really bad news to tell you. And she told me about a relative who had fallen ill. And that relative happened to be uh, very close to her. And it was a like a like a child of a man, and that man happened to work advertising. So she went and told this relative about me that I had had, and that you know they've been suffering for a long time with this this um, health issue, and the actual dream itself brought them a lot of comfort. So I I don't know if it's something. You know, me telling them the experience that I had seen was something that is kind of making them think, well, you know, we should maybe feel like there's something more going on here, more to life, and maybe have, in, at least in their case, have faith in God, um, potentially. I mean, I, I, I do believe in God myself, but I'm, I'm always open-minded to other possibilities. Um, you know, I'm interested in your theories and I'm interested in, um, in the science behind them. Um, but also, you know, other possibilities, angels, um, ghosts, um, you know, all of these kind of things, even, even aliens. And that was something that I've always been quite reluctant to talk about, but I wonder where the information comes from and why it's in code in the first place. Why can't they give it to us literally? Mm. Why can't they just tell us, you know, 
I mean, I know some people do have dreams where they see things in the future and they're told very precise information. But oftentimes people might dream very symbolically and it's only after the fact that they realize that the symbols match something you know that's now in the past. And it always made me wonder, well, why would you, if that, now subconscious is so intelligent, which we all know it is, why make it so difficult for ourselves? I mean, there are plenty of people that have had their lives saved by dreams. You know, they, they've dreamt of health issues and things that they've had, and it's actually made them go to their doctor. And, but there's also cases where people have had these dreams and they've not gone to their doctor, or they've gone to their doctor and their doctor said, no, you're fine, don't worry about it. And so the dream is being consequential, which is, for me, is very confusing because it, you know, like I mentioned before, sometimes dreams know what you're doing, they know your future. But if they know your future, then why would they tell you that you're going to die of something and then you die of it? And, you know, why would they have told you if they know the future? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make sense, does it? Uh, unless this, it's. This is, the, this is the magic, and it's something that intrigues myself and my little group. And we discuss this a yeah. lot. And I'll, be, I'll bring in Sarah in a second on this. Because, for instance, I'm quite intrigued at the moment, and I don't know if it's anybody else, but your bandwidth seems to be flicking in and out as if the archons don't want us to be talking about this, which is quite frustrating, but quite yeah. unusual in the sense of yeah. soon we get onto something that is really, really pertinent games start to be played and i'm reminded here again of the joe fisher book the hungry ghosts and the idea that in some way you feel like we're almost being played with that there's this kind of yeah. big game going on where we're given information and i know in ufology for instance the amount of times that people are given spurious information deliberately to discredit them you know now you know you one could argue i'm being phenomenally yeah. here and they were wrong in the first place but that doesn't seem to be the case they seem to be genuine but the information source plays with them in one way or another, mm, you know, definitely. and again, it's very much the kind of the John Keel idea of, you know, the cosmic jokers and everything else. But I'd like to bring yeah. Sarah in here because already, you know, this is this is building up to being a fascinating three way discussion about the true nature of reality and the games that are being played here. Now, Sarah, I know that yeah. you're, you're heavily into your own dreaming and precognitive dreaming. So I know that you're going to make some very interesting points here as usual. I'll try. <laughs> um, um, yeah, really interesting stories, Daniel. <laughs> amazing, interesting experiences that you've had there. Um, I've, I've become really interested in this idea of um, divination by reading the sort of patterns and rhythms of reality and the cosmos, and especially with regards to ancient dream culture, which you know I'm especially interested in. Um, most divination really stems from this idea of observing the stars and the stars yeah. being imperishable, immortal, eternal beings, and therefore they're privy to not only the distant past, but also the distant future as well. And I, and I think that dream divination yeah. is tied in with the stars because they're seen as nighttime oracles and dreams occur when we're, the stars are visible in the night sky. So perhaps in a way we're being imprinted with star wisdom when we're sleeping at nighttime. And then also it's interesting that you mentioned so many of your experiences revolving around water, which I think is a really important element for dreaming. And in particular, I have this yeah. recurring dream, which is my absolute favorite dream. And one time I worked out what the dream meant and I stopped having it and I was gutted. So I made myself start having it again because I love it so much where um, I nearly have it every night where I'm, I'm questing for this water of life and it takes on all these different guises. And when I drink it, I don't always get to the point where I drink it, but when I drink it, it's like it alters my consciousness when it enters my body. And I think that ancient people, they looked at the stars reflected in bodies of water and that water was seen to be then infused with the, the wisdom of the stars. And if they drank of it, then they could, you know, they could um, take upon the uh, wisdom of the stars. And I think I've mentioned it in this program before. Um, I recently, for my book, was researching um, the First Nations of Australia's star law. And I didn't realize how incredibly um, in depth and vast that knowledge was. And I've just read this one quote from an anthropologist that was saying that the, the people that he met in the desert in Australia, they had a myth or story that related to nearly every single star in the night sky. And the movements of the stars were used as a calendrical system to track things like when was a good time to go hunting, when was a good time to plant things, when was a good time, when would the rivers rise, like all these kinds of things were 
uh, ways that the stars actually predicted the future. So in a really pragmatic yes. and, and um, ordinary level, the stars are predicting the future and the stars are part yes. of the cosmos. And I always think about that idea that, you know, when you look out into the night sky, you're looking at time millions of years ago and it takes so long for light to travel to hit our eyes. So already we're living in this weird bubble of this uh, encapsulated time, I guess. So I believe that beyond our uh, human perceptions, there is a greater type of time and that that type of time is also um, incorporates a lot of other times of other planets and other kind of celestial bodies and things like this. So I think it's possible to tap into a non-linear time. And I think time being linear is an illusion anyway. So I, th I do think that's possible. Um, yeah. When you look at ancient dream, um, oracles and prophecies and, and I find this really interesting is generally speaking like you were saying Daniel and I think you made a really good point they're not just straightforward here's the exact details of what happens when they are often symbols and clues that really your the the full kind of gamut of your consciousness is probably taking on board every single day because we're exposed to vast amounts of data without really recognizing it consciously so there's a huge huge element of it that I think is um, a high, you know, higher self or unconscious information uh, rising up into consciousness during dreams and sleep. Um, but I also think there is a potential to tap into this collective unconscious power somehow as well. And I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think like you were saying, Daniel, that there are lots of factors at play and there could be all kinds of influences that are making precognitive dreams occur. And I think yeah. when you read about... Um, yeah. When you read about ancient, say ancient Egyptian dream interpretation, for example, is all word based and all kind of pun word plays. And um, and this kind of goes to, to some degree, goes to show how language shapes our consciousness and gives form to things in our dreams, especially. Yeah. And I'm really into um, the wild technique for falling asleep, you know, as you're falling asleep and you try to keep a thread of your consciousness. And when you do that and you get used to doing it, you recognize that any thought that you have or any word that appears in your mind becomes in instantly manifest as an actual form in a dream space. And I often describe it as Alice falling down the rabbit hole because that's what hypnagogia really feels like. You're falling through the space yeah. of your consciousness and these various things kind of float past you. And if you keep a gentle, soft gaze, then you keep just going deeper, deeper down into, into a dream proper. So yeah. I think that our consciousness and our dream experiences are very much seeded by the words that we take in. And, and with regards to how yeah. much information we're taking in these days, like people scroll on the internet constantly, every single word is going into your consciousness on some level. And I think people yeah. underestimate just the sheer amount of data that we're exposed to. If you try to compare us to something like ancient farmers who didn't read or didn't have newspapers and certainly didn't have the internet and were had a very very limited kind of palette of visual and intellectual phenomena to consider so um so yeah i mean i think there's a lot to it and i think water in dreams is especially interesting and, and usually relates to memory and emotion and um and the fact that yeah. perhaps these traumatic experiences when they're occurring they're creating a vibrational pattern in water somehow and that that somehow affects the collective um unconscious experience i don't know i mean who knows we don't know we can't know but um we can like talk I mean, about it and stuff i always say that's really interesting the points that you make especially about the way that your your thoughts and your words can shape the reality of your life and the world around you um, when it comes to 2017, I was focusing a lot of research on Colombian death squads. I was looking at US foreign policy around South America, Central America. And so I, you know, I, I was a little bit stressed that I was doing that as well, because you're reading about, you know, lots of bad things that happen to people and you, you feel very helpless that you can't help them. So I had a lot of that going on and maybe that potentially influenced my dreams, especially this heroism maybe even something to do with missing people as well, because there's lots of missing people in Colombia, unfortunately. Um, but as well at that time, and, and this is something that I did, which I found very interesting that got me into really looking at my own thought patterns, was the, um, the Japanese rice experiment. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that. And it's, no, please, please. It's, it's where you, um, so basically what you do is you, you set up two jars with a little bit of rice, 
film water, cover the top with cling film, and you write the words on one of them, love, and on the other one, hate. And you put these in your house or anywhere where you kind of feel that they are not more subjected to sunlight than the other one, for example, that might influence the outcome of this. And what you do is every morning, you're amazing, you're fantastic. And then to the other one that says hate, you'll say, you know, I hate you, you're horrible. And you do it, you know, just for like maybe a minute, you know, because you don't want to influence yourself thinking these things every day, but you do that to the, uh, the rice, you look at it, and you do it every morning and every night. And I did it maybe 10 times. I moved them the jars around the house in different places. And every time that I did it, at least, I'm sure a lot of people will find the same. I had this kind of horrible mold that went right to the top of the, um, the jar in the hate jar. And the love jar would not always have, uh, it, it sometimes have like a little few bubbles on top but a lot of time it'd be a lot clearer. But I found that it, there's a big disparity between the hate jar every time and the love jar. And so I, I just did that. And then I started thinking about, you know, how my thoughts influence my own reality, my own health, people around me. And yeah, it just got me into, I, I, I don't know if that was before, I can't remember if that was before or after the 111 um, incident. Um, but yeah, I, just, I, I found it like something that I felt was very important to me at the time. So it's really interesting as well with Sarah mentioned water and, you know, touching things is something that people do in psychometry a lot to get information. And if you think about it, I think you can read it in Bill Bryson and, and you know, the Brief History of Time, things like that, that, you know, the water that we drink is full of atoms that have been through many people. Many people throughout history have drank this water and we are having those same atoms that even made up that person go through our bodies. And if you can, as, as some of these psychic detectives can do, I'm not sure if I can, but they touch um, objects and they can get readings, information in their mind from psychometry. So they might go and pick up something that a victim dropped at a crime scene and they'll touch it and they'll receive impressions of the past incident, you know, that led to the death of so and so person. So if you think about it, maybe the, even the water that we drink and the world around us, because we're all connected through, you know, the atmosphere and you know, atoms in the air, we're all connected. And if, you know, the, if there is no time and it's all just, you know, an illusion in our brain, that you know, time is moving in one direction, you know, that we're all connected. So why can't we? It's just where we choose to focus our attention that might mean that that is why I had those particular dreams because I was thinking of death squads in Colombia and Guatemala and, you know, all of these other countries across the region. I think that's very important. And it's important even to, to reflect for a moment, you know, on what we know about quantum mechanics and quantum physics, you know, real quantum mechanics and physics, not the uh, the quantum mechanics that's talked about in a lot of the new age communities, but the idea of entanglement, the idea of non-locality. And for instance, uh, many years ago, I was invited to meet up with um, the professor of physics at Manchester University. We were doing an event together in London and over coffee, he said, we know, we know the science knows that every, every electron in the universe knows the location of every other electron. Now, if we work along the assumption that at the first moment of the Big Bang, every single subatomic particle was effectively in close proximity or indeed in a point reality with every other subatomic particle, they were effectively entangled from the first moment. So therefore, every subatomic particle is in effect related to or part of every other subatomic particle. And of course, because they are the building blocks of everything that we perceive around us, it's therefore not illogical to conclude that there's a form of communication going on here. Now, there are recent experiments being done about the, the, the true nature of reality. And, you know, strong evidence now is that not only is it mathematical, but it's information based. And the idea of even distance and space and time are all very much um, brain constructs. It, 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 these are the things in order to make us function in the way we can within this reality, this is how we work. But as you and I know from our personal experiences, 
we know that time, as Einstein said, is an illusion, but a particularly powerful one. Now, one of the things I'd like to touch on, because Sarah touched upon it slightly, you also mentioned it earlier on, which I'd like to, to expand upon a little bit, is, is the theories of John William Dunn and J.W. Dunn and his experiment with time and his concept of serial time. And I, I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit about that for the listeners or the viewers as well, because you are a particularly excellent example of exactly how Dunn's theories of serial time might work. Yeah, I mean, I, I do believe in it to an extent, but I think there might be other things at play, like Sarah said, that are actually showing us the future or even constructs of the future. Maybe they're seeing things that are in the minds of people at this moment and kind of giving us a kind of construct of what they think might happen in the future. Um, but yeah, J.W. Dunn was like an aeronautical engineer and he had dreams of um, a volcano erupting, Mount Pelly volcano erupting, so that's a French speaking island. And for him in particular, the interesting thing that he found was that, I think that in, in the actual dream that he had of the eruption, he had dreamt that there were 3,000 victims, but when it actually occurred in the waking world, there were 30,000 when he was reading the paper. But the interesting element from this um, experience of his was that when he actually read the newspaper itself about the actual eruption that occur, um, he actually found that he misread the newspaper. So he misread it as 3,000 rather than 30,000. So he came up with the idea that he must have sent back this misreading you know, in the future back to his past self. And so I think that is the kind of, um, the, the, the general kind of basis for, for a lot of his thinking when it comes to um, serialism. Um, but for me, I mean, it's, it, it, it's an interesting area and I think there are very many mundane things that we all tend to dream of that we see in the future. And you, you think, know, well, why did I dream of this just to, just, to, just to clarify this, in, in my forthcoming book, I actually call them mundane duns. <laughs> that's the actual term i use is the mundane duns You're kidding me oh my god um but yeah it's um when i mentioned very earlier on at the start of our chat I, I mentioned about the um the london and manchester attacks in 2017 one of the interesting little side points from that dream was that i wasn't sure if it was a truck or a van in the dream mm that the um, terrorists used to hurt people. And later on, I actually found a news article that the um, terrorists had planned to rent a bigger sort of truck lorry type thing, but they couldn't get it. And they ended up having to get a van instead. So for me, I wondered whether, you know, something that was going on in the present and past and what I, because there were many, there were quite a few little things that didn't quite perfectly add up. And I wonder if that's because, you know, the information that I sent was a construct of the future mm. rather than the future itself. So I'm not saying that, you know, you can't receive the actual information from the future, but I'm saying that there might also be other elements, angels or God or extraterrestrials or whatever you want to believe or higher self um and what they think is going to happen in an attempt to try and stop it but the problem is there's i don't think there's been many examples in the history of the world where a big disaster has been averted by any uh you know supposed psychic mm. um however there have been many personal instances where people have saved loved ones people close to them as well as themselves, if they are indeed saving anyone at all, because they, as I said before, maybe they were always meant to have the dream in the first place and they were never supposed to die. It was just- the emotional, content, the emotional content seems to be really important with regard to dreaming, especially because it's, uh, it's that sort of nexus of emotion and memory. And um, I wonder whether there isn't really an ethical or mor moral overseer. It's more about the strength and the power of the emotion involved. So there wouldn't necessarily be someone who's like, I want the right thing to happen or I want the good thing yeah. to happen. It's more the emotional thing is brought to your attention in, in some configuration or another, and then you have to work it out. It's reminding me of, um, remember Graham Nichols' story mm -hmm. about the, the Soho bombing? 
um, and he wasn't given like a time or a place, but obviously there was a lot of heightened emotion in that area at the time, but it was impossible yeah. to kind of um, know exactly when it would happen. Well, I think to me, one of the things that is of interest here is again, applying the, the quantum mechanics to this in that just before he died, um, Stephen Hawking wrote a paper with um, Frank Hartle, oh, Thomas Hertog, sorry, of CERN. And in the paper, he, in the paper he, he comes with an idea he calls the top-down hypothesis of quantum physics. And in effect, what he's arguing is that every potential outcome of every event that takes place at the subatomic level, and therefore every event that can possibly happen, is already encoded within the information field. And our intentions and our observations of them collapse the wave function of that particular reality rather than another one. So it could be what was happening, say, with you, Dan, is that you were perceiving one of the kind of overlapping potential realities where the guys uh, at the Borough bombings and Borough attacks had managed to acquire the larger truck. And indeed, this is why a lot of the information we receive during these um, precognitive events seem to be confused and confusing. And another point I would like to make here, which is of profound importance, is how this can be linked to out-of-body experiences, because, you know, Sarah mentioned Graham Nichols, and of course, Graham Nichols' famous out-of-the-body experience that took place when he perceived the Admiral Duncan bombing, nail bombing in Soho in 1999, uh, was that he was in an out-of-body state, and it was in within the out-of-body state that he perceived the terrorist attack taking place. Now, there are two points to be made here. The first one is, and it is a powerful point which I need to ask you as well, and you can answer after I've finished, is that Graham calls it the Cerulean effect. And he argues that he knows when his out-of-body experiences are precognitive because there's a shift towards the blue end of the spectrum and everything seems to be tinged with a different kind of light. Now, the other argument here, just very quickly to get in, is the number of people that are involved in, in my work and the people that have been interviewed in this program also have, have powerful out-of-body experiences and lucid dreaming states. And again, they argue that when they are in out-of-body states where they bring back information from elsewhere, 80% of the information will be right but parts of it will be completely and utterly wrong. Like there'll be a set of circumstances that one of my friends was telling me only a couple of days ago where she saw her mother at home in Dublin. And she noticed that her mother had placed some plants in different locations than what they normally were located in the corridor, which she then subsequently discovered was exactly what her mother had done. But the intriguing thing was that in the dream, her mother was talking to her, her, her brother, who was not there and had never been there. So there's these kind of overlaps of times and potentialities that seem to meld in in some way within our subconscious as if we are co-creating this reality in some way. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, in terms of going going to the specifics of the um the color and prophetic dreams i the only real experience that i've had that i can think of when it comes to an, an altered color in my dream color state was when i actually had an astral projection which is only a couple of times i'm, I'm not a massive expert with this unfortunately but what i noticed about the two dreams that i have had with astral traveling was that when i left my body everything was gray there was no color at all um, but when it comes to the actual prophetic dreams that I, I think I had, um, they, they did seem quite everyday dream colour to me, to be honest. So I, I think the only real difference for the London and Manchester one was the, the emotional intensity of those dreams. But then, you know, the dream that I had when it came to the Russian invasion, there was no um, emotional intensity of that, but it was more just me being in another body. And I think having someone else's thoughts yeah being in someone else's dream is so natural you know you don't realize that it's not yourself so when you are actually in someone else's body in someone else's mind experiencing what they're feeling potentially it feels natural and it makes you wonder whether ever everything is kind of scripted and if you were in somebody else's body at any point in time you would experience life exactly the same as they would Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of um, astral protection, that's that's pretty much one of the few experiences I have had, just those two um, experiences where I 
was in this flat and the first one I was stuck in the ceiling. <laughs> I couldn't get out. And then I, I woke up and then another time I actually managed to bounce off the ceiling and I came down and my cat saw me, <laughs> which was interesting. <laughs> I wish I could ask so many times in, in, in out of body yeah. states, cats see you and react to you. So yeah. that's interesting, isn't it? And, and you know what? I think that, you know, e there might even be pe people around us now that are watching us in their dreams, people that are asleep halfway around the world watching us. I mean, one of the, the strangest experiences I had was before all of this stuff started happening. I had an experience where I was sleeping in a different room um, in my house um, because my mum had visited and she was on my, in my bedroom on the ground floor. And I was in my friend's room upstairs who'd gone away. And that night I felt like something was watching me in that room. And when I opened my eyes, there was a man in grey, sat in a chair, just looking at me. And then I woke up and that was it. Um, when my friend got back from London the next day, I told my other friend who lived with us, there were three of us, after my mum had got home, I told him about the experience that I'd had. When my friend came downstairs, you know, I said to him, how are you? How was the weekend in London? And he said, oh, I don't feel too good. I felt like something was watching me all night from the chair. So for me, that, that was quite interesting because it made me wonder whether some of these things are kind of uh, location specific. Mm. I don't know if maybe it's some portals may give us more access to certain areas or certain people can stimulate things around them more than others, um, or they might be more open-minded to the paranormal. Um, so there's just so many elements that are, are very strange to me. And I you know the, the location specific thing where I'd gone in that room and something had been disturbed that was linked to that chair, mm. that, that at least, you know, and I forgot to mention, I heard Dan whispered in my ear and that's what made my eyes open. And that's when I saw this gray Arab man. What did you hear uh, in your ears? Do you, I missed that because you broke up. What, what did it, you hear? It, it was my name, oh, just right. Dan. Okay. Just Dan whispered in my ear and that's what that's why I opened my eyes and then I saw the, the guy on the chair but before I went to sleep I felt like something was watching me and I don't usually feel that way it was very like a strong feeling that something watching me in this room checked behind the curtains checked in the cupboards um it was very strange but yeah I mean we think our own re realities together I mean we can do it in dreams why can't we do it in waking life you know there's there's Samantha Treasure who's got that really great story about um someone saying you know i was in your dream last night did you see me they said no then they said to her you know didn't you see that white rabbit and then she's like white oh cat. yes white cat. yeah it was white, white cat. cat sorry yeah <laughs> yeah so for me that was amazing but um yeah i mean our dreams weave together in very interesting ways and you know sometimes our dreams can see the future of other people um you know, sometimes they can warn us of things and we can tell them. I mean, who's to say what, which reality, if they're not different, you know, is more important. People, we always come from the assumption that the waking world is so important. We need to stop this. We need to stop that. But then you've also got the dreaming world. And why is it that we feel that, you know, this reality is much more important or more valuable? I mean, I personally think it is. I don't know why, but our suffering seems to matter, at least in my opinion. Um, I don't know if, if it's the dead talking to me in my dreams, because sometimes I hear like in a dream, like a whisper, like um, there was one dream where I had about a victim and, and the, the whisper in the dream was he pees on them. Very strange, you know, like little details that were just kind of like almost like a narrator within the dream telling me little details. And it makes me wonder, well, is where is that coming from? Is it a ghost? Is it something whispering into my ear as I sleep, just as, you know, in, in the, uh, the instant with my friends? Um, it's just, it's, there's a lot of different things going on, I think. And it's very hard to kind of pull them all together and make sense of them all. I think the best thing for me personally to do is to keep logging these experiences in my dream journal to see which ones are more kind of common and which ones are kind of maybe uh, aberration from the usual dream elements that I would usually have. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting 
you know situation to try and make I sense of and I think in what the point you were making earlier on you know about logging in for want of a better term into somebody else's consciousness in these states and in this I'm reminded of you know the concept of either Robert Munro and the the case whereby he he regularly visited and became to use a technical term within spirituality and within mediumship a drop in in somebody else's consciousness where he literally took over and I argued in one of my books it's almost as if that person had gone into an absence state you know a temporal lobe epilepsy absence state and he's looking through this guy's eyes and seeing yeah. the world and he consistently goes back into this place and you know referencing uh, Sam, Tra Sam Treasure's stuff where she has this concept of um what she calls future Tokyo where she goes and she sees through yeah. the eyes of this android in future Tokyo and these are regular occurrences where you know these people go back to the same place and seeing the world through somebody else's eyes mm -hmm. so again you know this comes back to the idea are we one singular consciousness experiencing itself subjectively and in mm -hmm. dreams we drop into the greater the Jungian over self, the, the subconscious, the, uh, the collective unconscious, whatever we want to term it. But we have this concept, don't we, of individuation, because that's what we think we are. You know, we have this concept of ego. But in reality, mm. could it be that everything is ego less and we are all just yeah. a singular consciousness? You know, and you touched upon the concept of God before, you know, and could it be, as Philip K. Dick argued in The Divine Invasions, that, you know, that we are one single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively again to quote bill hicks you know there's a lot of areas of absolute fascination here but what i love about it is 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 the confusion of it all as we yeah. touched upon you know the kind of the the impishness the more you get into this the more ridiculous it becomes the more you're you're, you're actually dealing with um terence mckenna's machine elves having fun with us in some ways if to say this is this is a kind of an experimental scenario we're in just to see how we're going to react in certain ways to certain circumstances you know um one of the things that i know that you you also want to talk about which i think is profoundly important as well is shared dreams where, where two people or more than two people share the same dream and come back yeah. so tell us a little bit more about that well i'll tell you about a recent experience that's, that's worried me a little bit um Someone I know, like a relative, is going away to Spain and one of her friends had a dream that there was a big tsunami coming. And she said to me that, uh, she said to my mum that um, she had gone up the top of the building and she was safe, that no one could contact her. So, you know, obviously with a lot of the dreams that I have, I was a little bit worried about that. I don't know this person that had the dream. And so I kind of, was like, okay, well, maybe it was just a, a nightmare or something. Um, but then I, I had a dream about my mum being sucked out to the sea and the sea going, it was very scary because my mum, I care about her. She got pulled out and she kind of ran back round up the side of the kind of wooden fence towards the beach. Um, but then another friend of mine had, this is all recently, a dream of a giant tsunami in the Atlantic and the, the water was bloody red. And the thing that bothered me about that was that I'd had two dreams about that tsunami, and in one of them it was a bloody red, and I've written the words bloody red, and she had written the same. And this is a friend who lives on the other side of the Atlantic to us in the UK, and uh, and so for me, like sometimes I hope that these things are that we love in different ways, and maybe having positive effects in the world that way, and they're actually symbolic to bring people together. Um, and I hope that maybe there isn't going to be a tsunami, but, you know, these kind of things, the way they, they work and the way that there are markers within dreams that we have that designate to and signal to, you know, myself and other people that we are having a dream together. For example, another one of my friends, um, we both uh, dreamt of a kind of, a kind of folder that had been, like a file that had been torn along the top. And in the same dream, we dreamt of some men that were standing outside of a bar that were quite not very nice people. And that in the same dream, there was an umbrella. So there some very strange things that all matched up. And it, it, I, I felt like it was something that was trying to give a message to me and to my friend. 
but it wasn't coming through in a way that they wanted necessarily. And there was a clear message there, but there was nothing that I could ascertain from it, and nothing that my friend could ascertain apart from that we thought it was linked to a particular missing person. But what what we could we do with that information? I felt like it, you know, if the dreams know the future, why is it giving us stuff that we can't really do much about? But yeah, I mean, that dream was very interesting to me. Um, another dream I had with a friend was um, I dreamt of her and in the dream, I saw a face and the face had like these markings, kind of like face paint mar markings that went down here across the eyes and across the mouth. And I drew the picture. And then I told my friend, um, this is a dream I had about you. And I saw this face. And when I sent the message to her, she said, oh, um, no, it doesn't relate to me at all. And then later on that day, she messaged me and she was amazed because one of her friends had taken her to see a particular painting, a very specific painting that they had done themselves. And it, when he unveiled it, her mouth just dropped. She took a photo of this, um, this painting, which completely was the same as the drawing that I'd done, apart from maybe it was like a, a I, there was like a gap here whereas I'd drawn a line going all the way down but it, it was a very specific um, brown skinned woman that I'd seen with dark hair down to here in the dream and this this painting I mean and the lip the shape of the lips as well they're very kind of circular and quite small and it's just uh, I can't see if you if you are to give meaning to it which is something I tend to do quite a lot I admit that I believe in God and so on I, I, give, I kind of believe that you know this is maybe a, you know, a belief or at least showed her to be positive about things in life and this kind of confirmation of dreams you know can make people feel like we're being looked after somehow whatever by we, we don't really know but we you know, real opinion. Um, I think that's one of the amazing things that even where I might dream of some dark things occasionally, I mean, that there's something there that cares, you know, cares about these people. Something has happened to them, it's horrific usually, but there's something there that either didn't want it to happen, doesn't want it to happen, or wants them to be found for the, for the family, for their friends who might be looking for them, or even just for their soul. You know the victim so I don't know um, but you know some people will dream of the actual um, they'll dream of the consciousness of the murderer and they'll see through the murderer's eyes but I've never had that I've always been the other way around so I don't know if that means something about me personally but um, a lot of the time I'll, I will be you know the victim in those dreams so yeah it's, it's a it's like a big mystery to me but it's it's amazing every time even these, these tiny things happen it kind of you know, it gives me this energy again and this faith to kind of go on and keep delving into it. But I, I always have these situations where I kind of think, well, maybe it, maybe it is just chance that I dreamt that, that I dreamt this. Maybe it's just, you know, I just found something and just got lucky somehow with different things matching. Um, but then every time I get into that situation where I think, no, it, it can't be, something big will come along again in a dream and be like, come on, Dad, wake up. So, yeah. It's so, um, what I think yeah, is really very creditable for you is the way in which you continually question that you're continually looking for alternate solutions to the precognitions and saying, well, you know, am I really recognizing these things? And that is a very, very healthy approach and that I find extremely refreshing because it's the idea of this. This thing is a mystery and it is a profound mystery. I mean, for instance, all the time you were discussing there, I kept leaping into my mind saying, you know, that in terms of our modern understanding of science, what is the point of perception that's taking place in these dream sequences? You know, sometimes you'll say that you're seeing them, you're viewing them from somewhere outside the incident, then you're seeing it from the viewpoint of the victim. So clearly your consciousness is attuning into what, into what? it's a kind of, when you're viewing something from a location, as you said, with your out of the body experience from a location at the ceiling, what is doing the perceiving there? Because it's sure as hell isn't your eyes. Nor, and you are located yeah. in a completely different location in space, aren't you? You know, yeah. and it, this in itself tells us something very profoundly important about the true nature of reality. 
doesn't it? You know, but what does it tell us, Sarah? What do you think? Don't know. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that we could invest a lot more in our dreams and and um, not necessarily, you know, I think, Daniel, you're quite right when you're talking about sort of tsunamis and um, things happening. Often people have dreams like that because they do have a bit of anxiety about someone going away or about traveling. Like often if I didn't go on a plane every time I dreamt about a plane crash, just before I was about to go away, I would never go on a plane. Well, actually, I don't really like going on planes at all. But, um, <laughs> But, you know, you have those anxiety dreams. And, and I think identifying, you know, I always think that the best dream interpreter is also is always the dreamer and really becoming familiar with your your dreaming, your style of dreaming, why you dream. Um, I've really got into writing dreams down so that I can interpret them looking in the ancient Egyptian way of like interpreting the words because of the amount of puns and wordplay that I know now happens in dreams. Like I will dream about you know, if you ever dream about someone that you went to school with years ago and you never ever think about them and they, they aren't meaningful in your life at all, but then when you look at just their name or just their surname, that name will be the thing that's important in, in terms of what the dream yeah. is trying to communicate. So I think, you know, when people come to my dream workshops, often they watch loads of horror movies and they don't realise how much horror movies are just literally fuel for nightmares. Like, I always think that Yes. what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what media you look at, what films, even like watching like Screamy Shout East yep. tends to manifest as <laughs> arguments and stuff. And then also you mentioned, interestingly, uh, people thinking, you know, um, having dreams that they're ill. Often when we're asleep, we are actually picking up really subtle sensory impressions from our body that yeah. um, are yes. relaying very, very slight, subtle information about the physical state of our body. So... You know, to uh, to one one example might be you might dream that you're like crawling through a desert um, because your body's dehydrated at night or something like that, and then also those things manifest because really subtle physical sensations in the body at night are amplified because the body's in such a still, relaxed state, and they our body, our brain, and mind. Um, interprets that information into visual content, which I always think is really incredible. So we're always trying to make like a film almost out of the condition of our body and the things that we're picking up from the environment as well. So I think that there's a big case to be made. You know, we were talking about um, uh, energies and entities being location specific. And I think there's something really in that, mm. like this idea of geomancy or unhealthy homes, sick building syndrome. So many people are yeah. living in like supremely unfeng shui buildings and attempting to sleep in spaces that are totally wrong for sleeping in, you know? Um, and I think some basic understanding of like, just understanding what a base, a baseline relaxed, comfortable space is. People are so used to kind of living in this frenetic way. I've been around like people's houses where they've got um, like untold amount of electrical devices plugged in at the same time. I can I can hear like the sort of buzzing of electricity. And then, you know, when I moved into this flat, my landlords put the fire alarm and some other stupid alarm directly above my bed, which I just think is, <laughs> like who does that well someone who doesn't want to live in a house like this so um you know just things like that and and ventilation like having fresh air i've seen i saw a device yeah. on the internet that's like a little plastic canary that tells you when the air quality of your room is insufficient because the canary kind of drops and dies <laughs> so actually you know most people in the world are affected by pollution and we are sensitive beings and we are sensitive to all of these things and in particular something that i think just go so underestimated. I mean, I live in Hastings and I love living by the sea because I think it's like a grounding, energizing force to live so close to that element of water. But um, uh, noise pollution and the vibrations of loud noises are like working in our bodies all the time. And I think it's really important to sleep in a place where you can be as peaceful as possible. And um, I, one of the things I really noticed about lockdown was how beautifully quiet it was and how you could hear birdsong and there weren't many cars on the road. And it really was like an incredible, an incredibly different time to live in, which was actually in, on, on some level much more peaceful than normal chaotic life. Yeah. There were obviously anxieties around uh, coronavirus. But um, 
but yeah, I think that we're, we are so bombarded with stimulus and information all the time that we need to try to tap into the power and, and, and dreams are, can be very, very healing and, um, uh, very sort of creatively expressive. That's the thing I always loved about them most when I was a kid is how creative they were. Like to me, it was just the most amazing expressive form you could imagine. And they're free. So really everyone should be um, spending a little bit more time enjoying their dreams and, and kids should be encouraged to go to sleep more and not have to go to school so early. And that would be a good start as well. Well, as Robert, wonder, as Robert uh, Wagoner used to say, as Robert Wagoner has said on many occasions, who's the bricklayer and who's the person that does the dreams for you? I was sorry, I jumped in on you there, Dan, please. Oh, it's OK. That's all right. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, where you live can really impact your dreams. And, um, you know, it was a couple of years ago, I actually lived in quite a bad area. And for me, you know, you can go to university, you can go to paranormal studies and spend loads of money on them. I'm not saying it's not a great thing, but the best education I ever had was living in an area with high crime. Um, because that showed me that my dreams were definitely linking into real life, especially when I actually asked some of these characters about some of my dreams and they actually confirmed that this dream that you had um, about me doing something naughty is true, it actually happened. Um, and that, I actually had a dream um, of someone in a room and they were, this person was in my dream and that person stabbed the person in the stomach um, or at least they were going to, and that person's now in prison um, for rape, um, it, which I assume that they did in a room by a bed, like in my dream. So, um, like when you when you live in an area like that, and you 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 know you talk to people, and you kind of hear things that wouldn't always appear in the news, um, you know you do actually get confirmation about um, the power of some of these dreams. That is very interesting, something I'd never thought of before, you know, the way yeah, you pick up on the environment, you know, and that that is that is profoundly interesting and, and clearly has some significance there. One of the things, again, I, I, I'm very keen for you to expand a little bit upon is, is your work at the Arthur Finley College. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued about that. Um, so the work there was to do with finding missing people. So we did a lot of psychometry. We looked at photographs of um, you know, people that had gone missing. Um, and the strangest thing, uh, the strangest experience that I had with this um, course was that I kept getting numbers come into my head um, when they were talking about missing people's cases. Someone there at the college had told me to number the pages in my dream journal. And interestingly, because it was only a notebook at the time, I started the dream journal from the back of my notebook. So I started to number it from the back. And each time that they were talking about certain cases, I was getting numbers come into my head. And when I actually opened up the um, page in my dream journal, after numbering it, I actually found that the dreams corresponded, at least in my opinion, with some of the cases. So for example, um, I think it was the Lyra McKee case, um, obviously, when she, she she was shot by the IRA, she was oh. giving a presentation, and after the presentation, the journalist um, was shot. And um, I started getting a, a number. I didn't know it was her at the time. I just knew it was a case. They didn't go into details. And when I got to the page, it was to do with a woman who had given a speech at a conference, and she had a wristband, Make Poverty History wristband, and when she was leaving the conference, her wristband got caught on the door handle and there was something to do with a projector. But either way, when she got out of that conference, there was a man that was she was talking to that she didn't feel right about. And she had said certain things to that she felt weren't really her. She didn't believe in what she said. And she believed that was why she was executed. And I mean, it could just be chance, but the make poverty history thing, the page number, for me, that was a really interesting interaction of um, the waking world and the dream. Uh, there was another case where there was a party where a man had gone missing and the page number that I got corresponded to a man at a party. He had uh, people sing a song to him. It was a very particular song. Um, 
so yeah, I had, had those kind of experiences. I learned um, psychometry, um, how to do dowsing, had some interesting experiences with um, dowsing. Um, we, we did all kinds of things. We went up to a, a, an abandoned church that, that they have in the back yeah. of Stansted um, Halls. And where, this where, place where is they, amazing. They have a lot of there. interesting experiments there to do with uh, picking up um, sounds and noises as well, which I've heard, and they're quite intriguing, aren't they? Yeah. They take photos in abandoned buildings by cemeteries and try and catch things. They have um, all kinds of equipment, K2 meters to measure kind of vibrations in the air when, when they change, they can affect the meter. Um, there's um, lasers that they use to look for temperature drops and so on on, on walls. Um, yeah, it was absolutely amazing experience. And the reason I went there was because I, I actually found out about a man in Liverpool called Joe Power. And he had had a lot of dreams about a, um, a woman that went missing in Liverpool. And he had these kind of um, premonitions in his dreams that this woman's husband had killed her. And I know that's quite a common occurrence, but the dreams actually showed Joe that there were body parts around train tracks and around, I think it was an amuse, amusement park or amusement park, and they found body parts in those places. But everybody thought that the, um, the husband at the time were innocent. So I watched his show, I think it was on Psychic Detectives, the, um, in, in that series, he was on one of the episodes and um, I ended up going to one of his shows in Liverpool and he said to me, okay, well, why don't you go to the Arthur Finley College? That might help you hone your skills a little bit. So then I ended up applying and ended up going there. And um, it's an absolutely stunning place. It's like, you know, Hogwarts, a massive mansion surrounded by woods. They've got this abandoned church in the back. It's the perfect place to do research into any kind of paranormal activity. It's got a lot of history in there lots of different things that happened in different rooms you know you've got like uh, it was used during the war uh, i think it was used as like a hospital at some point uh, so they were really great with us they took us into rooms and they said well what what impressions do you guys get from this room what do you think it used to be maybe a hundred years ago and so we went into there and some of the people were really great at um you know guessing that this room down here was uh they used to store wine here but you know so lots of things like that that we did um it was actually on halloween that we went so it was the best time of year to go um and yeah i just i had a fantastic time i, I had some funny experiences as well i there's a there's a very famous staircase there called the whaling staircase and lots of people have ghostly experiences on that whaling staircase and um I was a bit cheeky and at night I really needed to lose so I left my room maybe at 1am and I thought okay I'm going to have a little exploration here so I went down the stairs and just before I'd done this as a group we were going up to bed up the stairs and we'd all heard a cat meowing and we all looked around and said where does that come from um, and there was a cat that used to live in the building that was you know everyone sort of knew about but when I went down on my own downstairs right down you know this bendy staircase I was on my own, I was in bare feet, and I swear to you, a, a cat jumped up right in front of me and meowed so loud, it, it, it scared me senseless. And there was nothing there, but it was definitely in front of me. Wow. I wasn't dreaming because there was a witness that saw me down there. <laughs> and I just went back up. But it just, there's just so many strange things that happen. And some of the things that happen are so strange that I, I just think it's not even worth getting into because you just feel it just adds too many strange elements to what is already bizarre enough as it is. And well, it they, they have all those, they have all those photographs and all those imprints in glass cases all over the place yeah. as well. But I think the thing that will amuse you more than anything else was that um, when, when I was allocated my room there, <laughs> one, 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 and I thought, mm. <laughs> and I actually posted that on Facebook and I said, you know, this is, this is, this is weird, you know, um, really enjoyed my time there. I, I found it was a fascinating place. And I used to live um, in one of the villages nearby there as well, Great Dunmo. Um, so I know, and I used to work at Stansted Airport. So I know that area. Well, actually, funnily enough, when I lived in the area, I didn't know that um, the hall was there. I wasn't aware because it's in its own grounds, isn't it? So it, it's off the main road. Yeah. um but such a curious very atmospheric place um yeah 
and I, I've been there two or three times, done events there, and, and really enjoyed it. Everything else, right? We're sort of starting to sort of wind down a little bit now. So, what would you like to talk about towards the end now? What are the things that um, the things that are interesting you at the moment? Because I know your website is fantastic. I really enjoyed Thank you. picking in, and having a look at that, and I strongly advise anybody to to have a read and get involved on there because I think what Dan is doing is is of great importance because he's keeping the information together in terms of precognitive and dreaming and things but what projects i mean i'm very intrigued with your your book somewhere beyond jupiter for instance which sounds um very funnily enough um very merseyside very much so because it's oh, there is. Oh, it's very olaf stapledon in many ways <laughs> um, well i don't know if you know everton too well i don't know if you've ever heard of the um the everton lockup no um no i'm from the okay. wirral we were we used to really go over okay. to because we never get back alive <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's um, you know the Everton logo, the Everton Football Club logo. There's yeah, like a little yeah. castle on that. Yes, yes, I do. That is the Everton lockup, and it was essentially um, it was a drunk tank for people, but it was some people call it the prison made for one. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of elements and places from within Liverpool and across the UK that have kind of found their way into my book, um, somewhere beyond Jupiter. Um, but the book essentially is about a man who's guided by his dreams without realizing that his dreams are actually leading him on an adventure and there's a group of people called the whisperers that live in another dimension that pass him his dreams so i call them his star sent dreams and i've got my first chapter up there on my website um, but it's uh, yeah it's a really interesting story where he comes across a kind of plan to create a staged world war three so everybody thinks he's mad when he's telling them these uh, dreams that he's having and he doesn't believe it. So there's a lot of similarities with little aspects of my own life that have come through there. Um, lots of dreams in there. There's a, there's a door that you can open by dreaming. So you have to go to sleep in front of the door and then you get the code when you wake up and you dream. Um, and lots of different kind of wonderful elements um, from the kind of fantasy realm this place called Lithoria, which is a place which is kind of a higher dimension to the world that we live in now. Um, so I've got lots of different um, kind of, uh, sort of elements going on um, within the book that I think people find really interesting and fascinating. Danny Torbicki, one of the people in the, um, the chat room, has just said, love the idea of the whisperers. So obviously that's going down extremely well. Um, one of the things that always intrigues me when, when people are writing fiction, I mean, where does it come from? D do you start with your storyline and you write the story or does it just develop as you, de as you write it? Um, well, I think the idea originally came from a call to a shop that I was working in and someone had misdialed my my shop. And so I started listening to the call and I could just hear this person mooching around, walking, opening doors and so on. And, and it kind of I thought I imagined to myself what would happen if I got a call to my shop and I discovered some kind of really um, devious plan. Uh, you know, and, and obviously in the book, the plan is to create a staged World War Three where people get rid of the undesirables in each country. It's kind of an agreement between them. But the, um, you know, the kind of idea sort of come from that original call to the shop, which was a misdialed call, I assume. And uh, so I kind of worked from there. And then the idea of the Third World War came up. And um, a lot of ideas came from dreams that I thought might be prophetic, like I dreamt of um, Donald Trump uh, nuking New York and flying off to Russia, um, God forbid. Um, I had a few other dreams that have kind of found their way into um, the book, which is just, I mean, it feels like you're cheating in a way when you get your, your dreams. It's like, is this my idea? You know, mm. I'm, I'm making a big uh, aspect of my book about this thing I saw in a dream. Can I really claim it? <laughs> so I, you know, I shouldn't really sign off on my own name. I should just put. Um, Let's hope you know. these don't come true because you know thoughts do create your reality. So uh, if it <laughs> happen, then we know it's your fault, Daniel. Absolutely. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I really, really, Thank really you. enjoyed Thank it. You. And and very much, Dan. Uh, there are other. I have uh, still still. It's not my group anymore. But there was a a very active group. Uh, when I was living on Wirral and we used to meet every second Tuesday in um, the uh, Walker Art Gallery um, and used to spend probably four or five hours talking about things like this for hours on end. Um, and I think they still meet up. 
um all right i think i'll try and sort of facilitate i know that one or two of them are going to be watching this anyway and be watching it when it's up uh, recorded right. and i'll put you in contact with them as well because i think your work is of extreme importance and really strongly stress anybody you know we need to start really collating this and trying to understand really what is going on and i always argue and sir and i always say this that people when they're on this on this show you know we're all being drawn together for a reason and that reason yeah. is that each one of you is bringing a little bit of the jigsaw puzzle yeah and i'm hoping that between us all we might one day get this co collective group together and we'll just sit there and go wow that's what it's all about and that was the moment that, that's the moment the meteorite hits you know but we shall see we shall okay. see Right. OK, if you can let everybody know we, we, your website, your various locations and how people can contact you, that'll be really good. OK, so um, if you want to contact me, you can contact me via email. So it's dan123taylor at yahoo.com. Um, obviously, my website is www.dreamprophecies.com. And you can also, if you want, follow me on Instagram, which is dream underscore prophecies. Wonderful. And thank you very much. Um, your, thank you. Your, your signal got a little bit better later on, and I'm not sure whether... I uh, apologise for that. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's the Archons. They always try. And it's always... I always suspect that when we're actually getting towards ultimate truths, the Archons get involved in one way or another. So we are, we are prepared for it and we know about it. Okay, thanks again, Sarah, for your involvement, as always. Um, uh, we've got a, a group of um, very interesting guests coming forward in the next few weeks as well, which I'm really looking forward to. And I'll be posting in the next couple of days the list, the updated list of the new guests we've got coming forward. So thanks again for listening. Um, this will be posted uh, on Facebook and it remains on Facebook. And on top of that, I'll be posting it on my own uh, YouTube channel as well. So thanks very much for listening, guys. And um, all the best for... Um, the next few days for all of you. Thanks very much. And we'll see you all soon. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.